Today, I'm talking about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, one of the books from the Chronicles of Narnia series written by C.S. Lewis. This book was written in 1950 and has been adapted several times, but we're going to focus on the 2005 Disney adaptation. Hey there, I'm Jessica, and this is Bookshelf to Big Screen. If you're new to the channel, I take a look at books that have been adapted to the big or small screen and tell you what changed. So if you only watch the movie and don't want to look like a fool at book club, be sure to subscribe. The story follows the Pevensey children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, as they navigate a magical world that Lucy discovered in the back of a wardrobe. Once there, they find out they've been prophesized to save this new world and must fight the evil white witch. This is the first book Lewis wrote for his Chronicles of Narnia series. However, he wrote a prequel to this story five years later. So if you want to read the series in chronological order, then this would be the second book in the series. Either way, the series is regarded as a classic. On the surface, this seems like a great adaptation and I really do enjoy it, but there are lots of little changes that were made, so let's get into it. The story takes place during World War II. The Pevensey family live in London and the children are sent to live with a professor in the countryside to escape the Blitz. They are picked up by the housekeeper, Mrs. McCready, who takes them to Professor Kirk's house. She warns them not to touch anything and not to disturb the professor. When Lucy first goes through the wardrobe, she meets a fawn under a lamppost in the snowy world of Narnia. His name is Mr. Tumnus, and he invites her over to his house for tea. After talking for a little while, Mr. Tumnus starts to play his flute for her. It puts Lucy in a daze, but she eventually comes to and says she has to go home. Mr. Tumnus starts crying and confesses that he works for the White Witch. He says he's paid to lure children to his cave and lull them to sleep so he can hand them over to the witch. But after meeting Lucy, he couldn't go through with it, so he takes her back to the lamppost so she can get back home safely. Lucy discovers that time works differently in Narnia. Even though she spent hours in Narnia, it was only a few minutes back in the house. This is true no matter how long they stay in Narnia, which we find out at the end of the story when after they've spent years in Narnia, they come back and still only a few minutes have passed in our world since they've entered the wardrobe. When Lucy gets back, she tries to tell her siblings about Narnia, but they don't believe her. When she tries to show them, the wardrobe has gone back to being an ordinary wardrobe. While Edmund is looking for Lucy in Narnia, he meets the White Witch. Once she finds out he's a son of Adam, or a human, she invites him to sit with her on her sled. She offers him something to drink and asks him what he'd like to eat. He asks for Turkish delight and she uses magic to produce them both. While he eats, she asks him questions and he tells her all about his siblings and how Lucy met Mr. Tumnus. The Turkish delight happens to be enchanted although we don't technically know this in the movie, and she has Edmund hooked. She promises to give him more and make him a prince if he goes home and brings his siblings to her castle. She tells him not to tell them, so it'll be a surprise, and gives him directions to her castle. After the witch leaves, Edmund finds Lucy, who tells him she had lunch with Mr. Tumnus. She tells him how bad the White Witch is, and it's a good thing that she doesn't know Mr. Tumnus let her go. Once they get back, Lucy tells Peter and Susan that Edmund also went to Narnia, but instead of backing her up, Edmund tells them he was just playing along with Lucy. Lucy runs away crying, and Peter gets mad at Edmund for being mean to Lucy. Peter and Susan decide to tell the professor about Lucy's delusion. He asks them why they don't believe Lucy. If she's not crazy and she's not normally a liar, he says that logically they must assume she's telling the truth. When the kids all get into Narnia, 
they go to visit Mr. Tumnus. But when they get to his house, they find the doors off the hinges and the house is wrecked. They find a note saying, Mr. Tumnus was arrested by the secret police for high treason against the queen. Susan is ready to go home, but Lucy wants to stay and help Mr. Tumnus. The kids meet a beaver who shows them the handkerchief Lucy gave to Mr. Tumnus as a sign they can trust him. He says Tumnus got it to him just before he was arrested. When they get to the beaver's house, the kids meet his wife and have dinner with them. He tells them Mr. Tumnus is being held in the witch's castle, but he says there's hope because Aslan is on the move. When the kids say they don't know who Aslan is, the beavers tell them Aslan is the real king of Narnia. And there's a prophecy that says two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve will defeat the white witch and restore peace to Narnia. Peter, Susan, and Lucy are trying to understand what they've just been told when they realize Edmund is missing. When Edmund gets to the witch's castle, he sees a stone lion and draws glasses and a mustache on it. In the book, it's explained that he thinks this is Aslan and that the witch has already taken care of him, which is why he feels emboldened to make him look silly. On his way to the door, he steps over what he thinks is a stone wolf, who turns out to be Mogram, the chief of the secret police. Edmund quickly explains who he is, and Mogram takes him in to see the queen. The queen is angry when she sees he's come alone, but he tells her that his siblings are at the beaver's house, and she calms down. While they're on the run from the witch, the beavers and children hear sleigh bells and think the witch has found them. They hide, and Mr. Beaver goes out to check, but he tells them it's safe to come out. It turns out to be Santa, who has been kept out of Narnia by the witch, but since her magic is starting to weaken, he was finally able to get in. He gives all the kids presents. Lucy gets a bottle of firefly juice, which will cure any injury. Susan gets a bow, a quiver with arrows, and a horn, and Peter gets a sword and a shield. Edmund eventually gets away from the witch, but she comes to see Aslan to remind him that, according to the deep magic, all traitors belong to her to kill, so Edmund must be turned over to her. Aslan says they'll discuss the matter in private, and when they're done, he announces that the witch has renounced her claim on Edmund's life. The night of the meeting between Aslan and the witch, Susan and Lucy see Aslan sneaking out of the camp and follow him. He eventually notices them and he allows them to join him, but at a certain point he says he must go on alone. The girls find a place to hide and see the witch's army is waiting for Aslan at the stone table. They tie Aslan up, muzzle him, shave his mane, and then put him up on the table. The witch tells Aslan that he gave his life for nothing because now there is no one to stop her from killing Edmund or the others. Then she kills him. After the witch leaves, the girls go and mourn Aslan. A bunch of mice appear and start chewing through the ropes to free Aslan. When the sun finally comes up, the stone table cracks and Aslan is gone. He reappears a little way off with his mane fully restored. He tells the girls that the witch didn't really know the deep magic or she would have known that an innocent person would turn back death by sacrificing himself. Aslan tells the girls they have a long way to go and to climb on his back. He takes them to the witch's castle where he literally breathes life back into the statues including Mr. Tumnus. In the movie, Lucy suggests they all play hide-and-seek the first night in the house. She finds a solitary wardrobe in a room and decides to hide there, but once she's inside, she finds herself walking into Narnia. That night, Edmund sees Lucy get up and follows her into the wardrobe, where he sees Narnia for the first time. In the book, 
Peter suggests they explore the new house. And this is when Lucy finds the wardrobe. It's not until a few days later when they play hide and seek and Lucy decides to try the wardrobe again. Edmund decides to hide in there with her so he can keep teasing her about her made up world, but instead he finds himself in Narnia too. In the movie, when Mr. Tumnus is lulling Lucy back to sleep, he sees Aslan in the fire. This scares him and he stops playing and this is why Lucy wakes up. In the book, Lucy comes to on her own. This is a pretty small change and I'm guessing it's used to kind of set the stage for Aslan's power and influence, but it gives the impression that Mr. Tumnus only did the right thing because he was scared of Aslan and I don't really like that. I think overall Mr. Tumnus is good in his own right and that's why he does the right thing by letting Lucy go. In the movie, when Edmund first comes across the White Witch, her dwarf attacks him and threatens him for addressing the queen directly. In the book, the dwarf is there driving the sled, but he doesn't attack Edmund. It's actually the witch who gets mad at Edmund. She even calls him an idiot. He's actually scared of her and hesitant to sit on her sled. I think this is a pretty important difference because in the movie, Edmund's first impression of her is more of a benevolent queen who saves him, gives him a special treat, and then promises to make him king. In the book, he's immediately afraid of her and is only soothed once he's had some of her enchanted Turkish delight. Then he's happy to answer all her questions. In the movie, when Peter tells the professor Lucy's been talking about going to another world in the wardrobe, he perks up, giving a little indication that he knows about it, but he doesn't really say anything about his belief that it exists. In the book, when Peter asks if he really thinks there could be other worlds, the professor says, nothing is more probable. He says Lucy may have found a door to another world because his house is very strange and that that world probably had a separate time of its own, which would explain why Lucy had been saying she'd spent hours there. In the movie, the kids break a window while playing outside. To avoid the wrath of Mrs. McCready, they run and hide. Edmund leads them to the wardrobe and as they all shove to the back, Peter and Susan are surprised to find themselves in Narnia. Peter calls Edmund out for lying and makes him apologize to Lucy. Susan is ready to go back, but Edmund tries to get them to look around. Peter lets Lucy decide and she suggests going to visit Mr. Tumnus. Peter grabs them coats from the wardrobe and they head out. In the book, the professor's house was kind of a tourist destination. It wasn't actually open to the public, but it was really old and people would come from all over and ask to see it. Mrs. McCready would give tours with the professor's permission. One day, the kids want to avoid her while she's giving a tour, and this is when they go and hide from her. But it's actually Susan's idea to hide in the wardrobe, and it's Peter's idea to get into the wardrobe. Once in Narnia, Peter apologizes immediately to Lucy, and then he suggests they go explore. Susan is the one who suggests putting on the coats, and Edmund reveals he's been there before by saying they should be going towards the lamppost. Peter kind of chastises Edmund for lying, but he doesn't seem to be very mad about it, and he doesn't make Edmund apologize to Lucy. Then Lucy suggests that they go visit Mr. Tumnus. In the movie, while they're trying to figure out what to do about Mr. Tumnus, a bird calls to them by saying, Psst. They follow it outside and meet a talking beaver. In the book, Lucy notices the robin and asks it if it knows where Mr. Tumnus is being held. It doesn't speak to them, but it does lead them for about half an hour to the beaver. On the way there, Edmund starts sowing the seeds of doubt in Peter's mind. He tells him that the bird could be leading them into a trap, and how did they really know the fawn is a good guy anyway? Peter is not convinced, saying the fawn saved Lucy. When they get to the beaver, he signals for them to be quiet and follow him. He does not talk to them until they're in a safer spot. 
The book describes what the children feel the first time Mr. Beaver mentions Aslan's name. Edmund feels a sense of mysterious horror. Peter feels brave and adventurous. Susan feels as though a delicious smell or some delightful music has wafted by her. And Lucy has the feeling of waking up in the morning and realizing it's the beginning of a holiday break. I'm not sure how they do this in a movie, and I don't believe it's essential to the plot. I just think it's an interesting detail in the book that kind of highlights the kind of people these kids are. In the book, when they get to the beaver's house, the kids help them prepare dinner. Peter and Mr. Beaver go out to catch fish while the girls help Mrs. Beaver fill the kettle, cut up bread, warm plates in the frying pan, and get Mr. Beaver some beer. It's all kind of extra detail, and there's some description of the beaver's house, but I'm glad it was left out of the movie. It feels like a need to emphasize the roles of men and women in a household, which were still very prevalent in the 1950s, but doesn't really hold up today. I do think it's important to note that there's no mention of Edmund helping at all. In the movie, when Peter and Susan find out about the prophecy, they are unwilling to participate and ready to go home. Lucy still wants to help Mr. Tumnus, but Peter tells her she'll have to let it go. But that's when he realizes Edmund isn't there anymore. In the book, Peter and Susan don't really give up. Peter is eager to help find and save Mr. Tumnus because he had helped save Lucy. The conversation between the beavers and the kids lasts a lot longer. The beavers explain how bad the witch is and that most of the people that get taken to her house are turned to stone. They say that Aslan is a lion and that he will save them all. They say the witch claimed the throne by pretending to be human, but she's not a daughter of Eve. She's actually the daughter of their father Adam's first wife, Lilith, who was a jinn. So apparently the witch was half jinn and half giant. The jinn part I get, that's where she gets her magic, but I don't really get the giant part because there's not really ever a description of her being physically giant and there's not really any reference to it after this. So I don't know. Anyway, when Mr. Beaver is telling them about the part of the prophecy where two boys and two girls have to sit on the four thrones to end the witch's reign and her life, he's saying it's a good thing the witch doesn't know there are four of them because she'd be trying to kill them. This is when they realize Edmund is gone. In the movie, after Edmund disappears, Mr. Beaver asks if he's ever been to Narnia before. And then it cuts to them following after Edmund, and they see him going into the witch's castle. Mr. Beaver tells them they can't go in after him because the witch is using him as bait to get them all there so she can kill them and stop the prophecy from happening. In the book, Peter wants to split up and start a search party, but Mr. Beaver says there's no use because Edmund has betrayed them and joined the witch. They don't believe him at first, but when he asks if Edmund had been to Narnia on his own before, they start to come around. Mr. Beaver says if you've lived in Narnia long enough, you can always tell who's eaten the witch's food, and he has suspected Edmund of treachery from the beginning. They realize if he's made it to the witch, she'll be coming after them right away and they need to leave. In the movie, after Edmund gives the witch the location of his siblings, she sends her secret police after them. Mrs. Beaver barely has time to grab a few things before the wolves break into the house. They manage to escape through a tunnel, and when they come out on the other end, Mr. Beaver finds his friends were turned to stone. A fox helps them by telling the wolves they went north. After the wolves leave, the fox tells them Aslan told him to gather more troops, and he leaves too. In the book, Mrs. Beaver takes her time to pack what they need because she knows they have about 30 minutes and that the witch will beat them to the stone table where they're supposed to meet Aslan anyway. So they'll need food and supplies to take their time getting there and sneak around her. 
There's no dramatic chase. They just walk for a while until they get to a secret cave where they stop to sleep. And they never meet up with the fox. But later, when the witch is out looking for the kids, she comes across a fox and a few other creatures having a little party. She gets mad when they say their food and drinks were gifts from Santa, and she turns them into stone. In the movie, Edmund is taken to a dungeon and meets Mr. Tumnus in the cell next to his. The witch is mad that Edmund's siblings weren't at the beaver's house, and she's about to kill him when Edmund says the beavers mentioned Aslan. Tumnus gives him a look to indicate he shouldn't say anything, so Edmund lies and says he doesn't know where they're supposed to meet Aslan. The witch takes Tumnus, but only after she tells him that Edmund was the one who turned him in, in exchange for some candy. Later, when he's being taken to the witch, Edmund sees that Tumnus was turned to stone. In the book, when Edmund is waiting for Mogram to get the witch, he sees a stone fawn and he thinks it might be Mr. Tumnus. He's never thrown in the dungeon and he tells the witch about Aslan's meeting location right after he tells her his siblings are at the beaver's house. He asks for more Turkish delight but is given hard bread and water instead. In the movie, they don't meet Sana until they're well on the way to Aslan. Also, Santa gives the gifts first to Lucy, then Susan, and then Peter. In the book, they meet Santa the morning after they've slept in the cave, and the order in which he gives the gifts is different too. He starts with Peter, and then Susan, and then Lucy. These aren't huge changes. The timeline has moved around because they added the dramatic wolf chase, and it's still mostly the same. But I wonder if they changed it to Lucy getting the first present because she's the youngest and probably has the strongest belief in Santa at this point. In the movie, the kids have to cross the frozen river to get to the stone table. But now that the witch's magic is weakening, winter is ending and the river is melting. Right when they get to the river, the wolves catch up to them. Instead of killing Mogram, Peter sees his opportunity to escape and he takes it. When they get out of the river, they see that spring has arrived. Mogram brings the fox back to the witch, who greets Edmund as your majesty. Edmund tries to save the fox from being turned to stone by finally telling the witch that Aslan will be at the stone table with an army, but she turns the fox to stone anyway. In the book, they don't have to cross the river, and again, they don't have another close encounter with the wolves. There's also no close call with the witch, only the previously mentioned encounter she has with the fox. But she finds out spring has come because she has to go way out of the way to find a place where she can cross the frozen river in her sled, and the ice starts to melt and her sled gets stuck in the mud. Because of this, she ends up having to walk. In the movie, they get to the meeting place and Peter draws his sword and announces they're there to see Aslan. There's a dramatic reveal as everyone kneels and Aslan comes out of a tent. Then the kids also kneel and Aslan greets them but asks where the fourth sibling is. Mr. Beaver says Edmund betrayed them and Peter says it was his fault for being too hard on him. Susan also tries to take some of the blame. Later, Aslan is showing Peter the castle with the four thrones where he will be king. Aslan tells him about the magic of Narnia. Meanwhile, Susan and Lucy are washing up by the river when the wolves attack. Susan blows her horn and the girls climb the tree. Peter arrives with Aslan and the others close behind, but Aslan makes them let Peter kill the wolf by himself. A second wolf gets away and Aslan sends a few people to follow it back to Edmund. Aslan tells Peter to clean his sword and then knights him as Sir Peter Wolfsbane. In the book, Aslan is out in the open among the other creatures when the group arrives. They're all pretty nervous to meet him, but Peter finally announces them, similar to what we see in the movie. There's no kneeling or anything like that, and Peter is the only one who takes blame for Edmund's betrayal. The girls are sent off with the other ladies so Aslan can talk to Peter. Their conversation is much shorter, though, 
Aslan basically just shows him the castle before they hear the horn. The fight with the wolf is pretty similar, except Lucy managed to run away while Susan climbed the tree. Aslan does tell Peter about the importance of cleaning his sword and makes him a knight, but there's one unusual difference here. Aslan asks Peter to hand him the sword, and he knights him in the traditional way by tapping the sword on each shoulder. This is the first indication that Aslan has humanistic abilities other than talking, which is later confirmed in an illustration with Aslan walking on two legs with his front paws behind his back. This doesn't really add anything to the story, but I thought it was interesting and it shows how he is different, whereas the movie keeps him more as just a lion. In the movie, we see the rescue party follow the wolf back to where Edmund is being held. We don't really see the fight or the rescue, it just cuts to the witch finding the dwarf tied up. The next morning, the kids see Edmund talking to Aslan. Aslan tells them they've settled it, and no one needs to talk to Edmund about what he did. The girls hug Edmund, and Peter tells him to go get some sleep. In the book, Edmund is really tired and out of it when the rescue happens. The dwarf is actually preparing to kill him since he and the witch have decided that's the best way to prevent the prophecy from happening. But the rescue party arrives just in time. In all the commotion, they realize the witch got away, so they take Edmund back to the camp. However, the witch actually disguised herself as a boulder and the dwarf as a tree stump when the fighting started. Mrs. Beaver is the one who tells the kids that Edmund was rescued, and they do see him talking with Aslan, but Edmund actually apologizes to them, and they all forgive him. In the movie, Peter says he's going to send them home while he stays and fights because he promised their mom that he'd keep them all safe. But they all agree that they need to stay. So they all get in some practice until Mr. Beaver comes to tell them that the witch is there to meet Aslan. None of this happens in the book. In the movie, the witch asks if Aslan has forgotten the laws upon which Narnia was built. And he replies with the meme-worthy line about not citing the deep magic to him because he was there when it was written. But in the book, he says, Let's say I have forgotten it. Tell us of this deep magic. Personally, I think this is funny because the movie version has been turned into a meme that I enjoy as someone who is one of the oldest of my cousin group and has been sent this meme on a few occasions. But also because in the book, Aslan is being so passive aggressive and it really gets the witch riled up. In the movie, we don't see the stone table until the sacrifice, but in the book, it's where the kids meet Aslan and then after his talk with the witch, Aslan makes them move their camp to another spot, and then he hikes back to the stone table the night of the sacrifice. In the movie, after Aslan dies, Susan says they have to go and tell the others what happened. Lucy has the idea to send the message with the trees. When they get the message, Edmund tells Peter it's time to finally step up and lead the army. Scenes from the battle are cut in between what Lucy, Susan, and Aslan are doing since they're happening simultaneously. Edmund tries to save Peter from the witch and manages to shatter her wand, but she stabs him. Just then, Aslan appears with reinforcements surprising the witch. The witch fights Peter and is about to kill him when Aslan attacks and kills her. The battle is won, but Edmund is seriously injured. Susan kills the dwarf who is about to kill Edmund, and then Lucy gives him some of the firefly juice, and he's immediately better. After she sees Aslan bringing statues back to life, she goes off to help the rest of the injured people with her juice. In the book, we read about the sacrifice, the resurrection, and the statue rescue before finally getting to the battle. So I kind of like how the movie has all those cutscenes to show the intensity of the battle. When Aslan finally gets there, he immediately attacks and kills the witch. 
and there's no near-death fight between the witch and Peter. Peter tells them that they only stood a chance because Edmund had the foresight to shatter the witch's wand after he saw her turning so many people to stone. There's no mention of Susan taking any part in the battle. Edmund was badly wounded, but Aslan has to remind Lucy about the firefly juice, and the effect isn't immediate. She wants to wait and make sure Edmund gets better, but Aslan has to make her go help the others. So in this case, Lucy is more concerned with her brother and has to be reminded to do the right thing, whereas in the movie, she remains this pure, innocent, good little girl, which I think is interesting. I like that in the book, we have this little reminder that even the best of us have our moments of selfishness or anger or whatever. We're not perfect. In the movie, Aslan crowns the kids as kings and queens of Narnia, giving them each a piece of the kingdom. He also gives them all titles, Queen Lucy the Valiant, King Edmund the Just, Queen Susan the Gentle, and King Peter the Magnificent. Lucy notices Aslan walking alone on the beach, and Mr. Tumnus tells her sometimes he'll be there and sometimes he won't. And then he's gone. In the book, Aslan does the coronation, but he doesn't divide up the kingdom. Once they've been crowned, the kids give rewards to all their friends and those who fought in the battle. When they notice Aslan is gone, none of them say anything about it because they remember Mr. Beaver had once told them that Aslan usually comes and goes as he pleases. We also get details of the years that pass while they stay in Narnia and grow into adulthood. This is when they come to be known by their titles given to them by the people of Narnia. In the movie, after the coronation, it cuts to the children all grown up, riding through the forest, chasing a white stag. They stop when they find the lamppost, and Lucy has a vague recollection and leads them back to the wardrobe. They fall out of the wardrobe and are found by the professor. A mid credit scene shows Lucy trying to get back into the wardrobe. The professor finds her and tells her she won't be able to get back in that way because he's already tried. She asks if they'll ever get to go back, and he says he thinks they will, but it'll probably happen when they're not looking for it. In the book, Mr. Tumnus tells them a white stag has been spotted, and it's known that a white stag will give wishes to anyone who catches it, so they try to find it. An interesting thing to note here is that the language they use now is different. They use Old English now, like Peter says, Madam, therein I pray thee to have me excused, which is just weird and kind of funny, but it shows how much they've changed after all these years spent in Arnia. When they spot the lamppost, they discuss how they've all seen it in their dreams and they decide to go forward and see what adventure lies ahead. Then they tumble out of the wardrobe minutes after they had entered and they can still hear Mrs. McCready with the visitors in the hallway. They decide to go and tell the professor about what happened because they feel like they need to explain why there are four coats missing from the wardrobe. To their surprise, the professor believes them and tells them all that they won't get back into Narnia through the wardrobe. He says they won't get back at all if they're trying to get back, that it'll only happen when they're not looking. Overall, I enjoyed this book and the adaptation. It's a great magical adventure story. There are nice elements like siblings sticking together through difficult times, stepping up to do the right thing, and finding forgiveness when you've made a mistake. Since Lewis really got back into his faith at the age of 32, and that had a big effect on his writing, so we see a lot of themes of Christianity in the Chronicles of Narnia. In this particular story, there are the obvious references like calling the children sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, who were, of course, the first people created by God. There's also the themes of sacrifice and resurrection. Aslan, like Jesus, sacrificed himself for the sins of another and then was brought back to life. There are some more subtle references like the mention of Lilith as the witch's mother. 
Now the Lilith myth is really more prevalent in Judaism and I went down a Lilith rabbit hole while writing this, which was very interesting. But basically the story is that Lilith was Adam's first wife and she left Adam because she believed they should be equals. She was not satisfied being subservient to him. As punishment for leaving Adam and the Garden of Eden, all of her babies from then on were born as demons. One other subtle reference in the story is the roles of men and women, which kind of ties in directly with the Lilith myth. There are little mentions about the girls making dinner and taking care of people while the men hunt, fight, and do the planning. Personally, I'm agnostic, so I'm not going out of my way to find stories with religious themes, but I'm not avoiding them either. While there are some very obvious references to Christianity, I don't find them off-putting or overtly preachy, and I can appreciate the story for all the other reasons I mentioned earlier. I also think it's kind of funny that Santa was included in this story because he's a character that can sometimes overshadow the religious aspects of Christmas. One final thing I like about this book is how the author addresses the reader directly at times to clarify something about what he's written. It's a device that doesn't always work because it can feel hokey, but in this case, I enjoy it. And it's very similar to how the series of unfortunate events books are written, which happens to be a favorite of mine. Well, there you have it. That's my recap on The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe written by C.S. Lewis in 1950 and the 2005 Disney adaptation. I've included links to both the book and the movie in the description below so you can check them out for yourselves. If you enjoyed this review, please click like and be sure to click subscribe to see my next video. Thanks for watching.